Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. A government shutdown looms, what it means for some state programs, and the clock is ticking for a new Viking Stadium. We update you on those stories and more in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The June 30th budget deadline looms, and negotiations continue to be at a virtual standstill. However, GOP leaders continue to meet with the governor, hoping to reach a global agreement before the deadline passes and a shutdown is implemented. The negotiation process was made public at this Legislative Commission on Planning and Fiscal Policy, Members continue to question the potential shutdown and scenarios that could happen. Uh, critical services number one is health safety. Uh, typically those are direct care services. Those uh, include uh, all of the uh, activities you would just commonly think of uh, needing to be continued. Uh, they do go to uh, care of individuals uh, in some of the uh, state operated <laughs> services, MSOP, uh, continued operation of our prisons. Uh, but they also include uh, emergency responses uh, in the example of transportation. If there's a buckled road, there needs to be somebody who's able to uh, respond and go and take care of that. Those are the kinds of critical life safety issues that are in that priority one. Priority two is activities that support those, that make sure that those activities continue um, uninterrupted. So for instance, in uh, veterans' homes, uh, you'll find that there are some support staff to make sure that basically those operations continue. While they're not operating at 100% level, they are uh, making sure that they've got their daily business uh, continuing on. Uh, it, I find it stunning that if your top priority is life safety, that we are not gonna pay people uh, to take care of folks in nursing homes or who show up at our hospitals. Uh, we did as we did in the previous shutdown of 2005. Uh, I cannot imagine if this, if, and I, that's why I asked you to actually repeat the priorities, because I thought that the first thing that you said was life safety. That we would not continue to process payments to uh, nursing homes and hospitals and folks who take care of the people who show up uh, ill and injured uh, and who are requiring constant care to survive, uh, that, that, that would not be funded. Um, I find that quite breathtaking. Here to talk about some of the potential health care impacts if there is a government shutdown, we have Senator David Hand. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. First of all, as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee for the Senate, let's begin with the bill that was passed and not signed by the governor. What are some of the reforms that you supported, and are there any that you think could make, make it into a final global agreement with the governor? Well, we did uh, have a number of, I think, uh, fairly significant reforms that we were trying to get at, and I would hope that as we go down this path of negotiation that some of them will end up in some form. It's hard to uh, usually get your entire uh, array of reforms uh, passed when you have a governor of the other uh, side of the aisle, so to speak, but we think that there are some elements in there that we think there should be agreement on. Uh, one of them is uh, we uh, have looked at reforming the uh, low-income health insurance structure currently under Minnesota Care. Uh, we, this is a uh, insurance program that requires people to pay a premium and they have a uh, sort of a adjusted premium rate depending on income and so forth and it's uh, designed for people that are working but may not have a high enough income to, to support a full policy. And what we're doing is, is offering them an opportunity to receive a grant, a direct grant from, uh, from the government to go out in the private marketplace and purchase their own health insurance. And we think for a number of reasons that makes a lot of sense. It does save a lot of money, significant money. And, um, and I think that uh, originally in the Senate bill, we had a very, very broad approach to that. Uh, we uh, narrowed that down a little bit in uh, conference with the House, and uh, I would hope that at some point when we reach agreement with the governor that there will be some version of that available uh, to the people of Minnesota. It does uh, represent cost savings, but it also reinforces the idea that private markets play a critical role in health reform, and you need to have the incentives of people involved in making decisions about health care, and even low-income people have the opportunity to do that. So that is one of the major reforms. Uh, probably the other large reform that we have in the bill 
is associated with a uh, restructuring or a, uh, reinvigoration maybe of the uh, CCDS uh, structure that Governor Plenty and the legislature agreed to a few years ago as a reform to the uh, general assistance medical care program that was uh, costs were rising so rapidly we couldn't possibly keep up with it. And what this is essentially is it's a, a, uh, a budgeted amount that is uh, distributed to uh, hospitals that is used by them to make decisions about how to care for the very, very low income uh, portion of the population that needs assistance. And we've uh, put additional resources into that and we're also looking at uh, changes in policy that would make that program more broadly available across the state. The state. And in response to some of the uh, feedback we got from uh, the hospitals that participated, we think there are some very good reform elements in that idea as well. So we hope both of those ideas in some form would survive. And we'll talk a little bit about the negotiations in just a moment, but first I want to shift gears to a potential shutdown. It's looking probable at this point, according to many. Mm -hmm. And so let's discuss, first of all, what this means for health care and different programs and services that are offered through the state. Well, I, I guess it depends on who you talk to. Uh, we just were in a meeting where we were talking with Commissioner Showalter uh, about uh, the governor's response to the attorney general's petition to the court in the event of a shutdown. And of course, when it goes to the court, what it gets to is a discussion of what is considered essential services. Uh, the governor's response uh, is arguing for a very, very narrow view of essential services, in effect saying that uh, uh, things like uh, health care for uh, medical assistance and so forth uh, uh, ought to be continued, however, uh, that the funding for it wouldn't continue. So it's, it's a, I'm not sure if I quite have figured out how that works yet, but that was kind of, in the governor's view, the way this would work is that those uh, services would continue, they just wouldn't be paid for. And I'm thinking that uh, that may work for a few days, but at some point people who are doing work are going to eventually want to see reimbursement for their efforts, so I'm not sure how that works. Uh, so there, there could have could be uh, impacts to people uh, in the event of a shutdown. Uh, I think uh, we went through this earlier in 2005. In that particular case, of course, uh, those activities were funded as a part of a continuing activity of government. I think that if you do go to a shutdown, they ought to be continued as part of what we normally would do. But I want to, re again, reinforce the, the point that we've been making, that there is no need to have a shutdown. I know we haven't reached agreement on all the budget with the governor, but it would seem to me that it would be preferable to have some sort of, uh, uh, for want of a better term, lights on legislation that would be adopted by the legislature to allow the continuing, the co continuation of the current budget structure. And we could certainly do that in the course of a, a day if, uh, if the governor called us back. And I think that would, in my opinion, be preferable than to go to a shutdown. According to Human Services Commissioner Lucinda Jessen, there were more than 500,000 letters going out to folks who are served through various <laughs> programs. And they were notified that any, that those who receive health care benefits, food support, adoption services, and other critical assistance may not be able to access those benefits and services come July 1st. The specifics were not given, but are those, in your opinion, critical services? Well, I think that, again, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, I think you, whoever you talk to, you're going to get a different opinion. Uh, you could go very narrowly and say the critical services are the things that the Constitution of the state of Minnesota specifies. Of course, health care is not included in that at all. Uh, you could look at a uh, more expansive uh, vision of that and say, well, critical services are anything that has to do with uh, things that might lead to uh, uh, medical necessity or, or endangerment of people, and that would uh, probably encompass a whole host of things like bridge inspections and payments to medical care, nursing homes, and so forth. Uh, so I don't know that there is a precise definition of it. Uh, I think as a constitutional question, it is certainly troubling to have the uh, courts uh, be in a position of making determinations that are the jurisdiction of the legislature. Um, but again, I think from our perspective in the legislature, uh, there are better solutions than relying on the courts to do this. And again, the simplest uh, way to do it if you don't have an agreement is to pass an agreement that uh, would allow the continue the continuation of the current budget structure so that everything that is going on right now would continue to go on until such time as a final agreement on the next year's budget would be reached and I, I think that would be preferable. And Senator, as you mentioned earlier, the GOP contends that a shutdown is not necessary That's and correct. they're holding tight to that. However, in the event that it's looking more probable, in your opinion, is a shutdown a better option than moving on the $34 billion budget target? Well, I think uh, when you say moving on the $34 billion budget target. Uh, new revenue. New revenue. Well, and, and of course we would say that our budget does incorporate a lot of new revenue. It incorporates, uh, from the perspective of the Minnesota taxpayer, almost $4 billion in new revenue compared to the current level of spending. 
Uh, if you add in the one-time federal monies, it's uh, you know about the same, maybe a little bit more than the current level. And in areas like health and human services, our budget calls for $800 million uh, in additional revenue from current levels of spending. So we would argue that we do have additional revenues in our budget. We think it is a balanced budget. What it doesn't do is it doesn't impose new taxes on income earners in the state of Minnesota. And that, we think, is, is very problematic. We are in the midst of a recession. People are now talking about a double dip recession. And to look at the people that are the job creators and the people that are in a position to uh, create uh, opportunities for, to work for people of Minnesota and to tell those people that they're going to be compelled to pay additional uh, amounts of money to finance the state, uh, that is not going to help the economy. And it's particularly troubling when you look at that group of individuals and look at the amount of money they currently bring into the state. Uh, in income taxes alone, about the top 2% of our, uh, income earners pay about 30% of the total income taxes that we collect. Now, I would say that's certainly fair, at least. And to add an additional burden to those people uh, is not going to help the economy, and that's why we've uh, been very firm about not going that route. So, yeah, so it's fair to say that you don't want to spend more than what's in the checkbook. That's correct. Okay. Senator David Hand, thanks for your perspective you today. Greatly appreciated. You bet. The game clock is ticking, but the drive for a new stadium remains alive. The Arden Hill site is preferred by the Minnesota Vikings, and as budget negotiations continue, the hope is that a funding mechanism for the new stadium becomes more concrete. And we are committed to working on this stadium and finding a permanent home for the Vikings. And um, of course we have a budget first to deal with and that's what we're going to deal with, but um, this is a huge priority and, um, and the negotiations and the talks will continue. And uh, I just want to again thanks, uh, thank the governor for his uh, commitment to this and the Wolves for their commitment, and we will continue our work. Our cap is $300 million, and Ramsey County stated its cap at $350 million. So we're going to meet uh, uh, to see if we can find ways to resolve the gap that remains in the financing. Uh, secondly, the transportation, which is a key component of that. The Minnesota Vikings are very excited about the Arden Hills location. Uh, we did a lot of study on it, and we feel it would be best uh, uh, serve for the Twin Cities area and the whole state of Minnesota, not just for uh, Minnesota Vikings events, but events that the Metro Dome has served well over the last 30 years. Joining me now to talk more about a potential government shutdown, we have House Minority Leader Paul Thiessen. Thank you for joining us on Capitol Report. Happy to be here. Let's begin with the latest on the negotiations and your thoughts as the clock is ticking down. Well, the talk, uh, clock is ticking fast. Uh, you know, people continue to speak uh, with each other, uh, but the big issue really continues to be, you know, this choice that Minnesotans have. Are we going to be a state uh, that continues uh, through its budget, squeezing middle class Minnesotans, you know, with higher property taxes, higher tuitions, uh, the things that are concluded in the Republican budget, or are we going to turn that around and say the way we build a better Minnesota economy, a prosperous Minnesota, is to build a strong middle class? Uh, and I think Governor Dayton's budget actually moves us much more strongly in that direction by uh, not making as devastating of cuts, making some cuts that we need to make, but also asking the richest 2% uh, of Minnesotans to participate. Uh, the fact that uh, the three polls that I've seen show you know, probably 60 to 65% support of Minnesotans for that kind of solution, I think gives us an indication of the direction we have to be going. Uh, the Republicans have been at $34 billion since January, haven't moved an inch. Uh, it's time for them to compromise and we can avoid a, a government shutdown, which nobody, nobody wants. And then David, Senator David Hand contends the exact same thing, that they, they don't think that a shutdown is not, is not, they don't think a shutdown is necessary. So I want to ask you the same question I asked him. If they don't move off of their $34 billion, is a government shutdown the better option or do you think the governor should then compromise a bit further to prevent it? Well, I think the governor has uh, compromised extensively. Uh, I think it really is time for the Republicans uh, to compromise. Uh, the consequences of a government shutdown are very significant. But I would note that a lot of the things that you um, will see as a result of government shutdown that the Republicans are complaining about, for instance, uh, payments not going out to hospitals, uh, in Senator Hans, or Hans' budget, 
uh, he cuts 140,000 people off of health care permanently and cuts a billion dollars out of hospitals every two years permanently. Uh, so that's kind of the choices that we're facing. Uh, we have this potential of a temporary shutdown, which would be bad, but the consequences of that all-cuts Republican uh, budget would be really devastating for the well, state. Let's talk a little bit more about the consequences, specifically with Health and Human Services. Human Services Commissioner Lucinda Jessen said earlier that there are more than 500,000 letters going out to recipients of pr different programs and they are going to those who receive health care benefits, food support, adoption services, and other critical assistance, notifying them they might not be able to access those benefits or services as of July 1st. In your opinion, are those critical services? Well, of course, of course they're critical services. I don't think anybody would deny that. Uh, but what we're dealing with now is a legal question under the Constitution, and the Constitution does say unless the legislature does its job and gets a signed bill by the governor and appropriates money, no money can leave the state treasury. It's a legal question that has to be resolved around that. You know, the Republicans made a choice uh, on May 23rd when they sent the governor uh, a budget they knew he wouldn't sign, that he was going to veto, uh, and left, left to the Capitol, went home. They took a risk at that moment uh, that we would be facing this government shutdown. Um, they could have offered a budget, as we always did with Governor Plenty, taking budgets that we didn't think were the best necessarily for Minnesota, but understanding that we needed to compromise. Uh, the Republicans seem to be in this uh, idea that it's their way or the highway. Uh, I think that's unfortunate and is not good for the state of Minnesota. So, Mr. Leader, with roughly three weeks left before the budget needs to be concluded, kind of talk us and walk us through the negotiations. What's a timeline that your caucus has and maybe um, when, do, when do things really ramp up? more than they have been? Well, you know, I think that they have been, uh, we've been working on things. I think it's going to ramp up every day as we get closer and closer to the shutdown because that uh, is not a result that anybody uh, wants. I think uh, it really is a time, most importantly right now, for the people of Minnesota to weigh in. The thing that gives me the most optimism uh, is that legislators, for the most part, aren't here in St. Paul at the Capitol. They're back in their hometowns talking to their constituents uh, about what the impact of the different budgets are going to have on their communities, on their hospitals, on their schools, on higher in education institutions in their communities, uh, on their property taxes. Uh, and I think once those conversations start to happen, that is when we'll actually see movement. What happens here inside the Capitol really does reflect uh, the voices of people outside the Capitol. And so now really is the time for people to call up the governor, to call up their legislators and weigh in, because that is what's going to move us uh, to a resolution. If there is no resolution, would you consider the legislature having done its job? I don't think that uh, we have done, uh, the legislature has done its job and um, you know the Republican majority left here with a um, an unsigned budget that was their job one they haven't created any jobs that was what they said was their job number two what they've left the legislature with this year really uh, is a constitutional amendment uh, to discriminate against certain uh, Minnesotans uh, that's really an unfortunate legacy are we to a point yet and do you think we could reach a point where perhaps there's going to be a lot of acrimony and things won't be done in the future because of what's happening now? You know, I, I hope that that's not the case. You know, I still think people are working uh, in good faith to resolve, uh, to resolve this, uh, this, um, this resolution. I hope, though, that we do get back uh, to, a, to, to a time. I think one thing that has changed is uh, we used to understand in our politics that there's a practical aspect to it. Uh, and that we all weren't elected on mandates that uh, don't allow us to move. And I think uh, Governor Dayton has recognized that with his compromise position on his, you know, he's not getting the kind of tax increase he campaigned on, right? Uh, the Republicans haven't figured that out yet, that what the people of Minnesota want is a government that works, that has some certainty, uh, and that allows people to compromise and to come together uh, around a solution that may not get everything that everybody wants, probably gets not everything that anybody wants, but is a place that Minnesota can build on going forward. Okay, Representative Paul Thiessen, thanks for joining us today. Thank we appreciate you. it. An ethics complaint was brought forth because of comments made over Twitter. During a debate on the Health and Human Services Bill, Senator Barb Goodwin stated, um, The way st uh, state institutions used to be, they were called um, institutions for idiots, imbeciles, and the insane. And that's what it said right, right on the hospital. Um, idiots, imbeciles, and the insane. The complaint is that Senator Hosman said that a statement was made about people, not about buildings. Three times in the in this, in this recitation, I've heard over and over again references to labels on buildings. I've heard now that, you know, heard the, the tape that shows Senator Limmer heard 
a comment was being made about labels on buildings. Uh, that seems fairly objective to me. Um, is there something that I'm missing, I guess, in that regard? And Mr. Kanai. Madam Chair, it, it's, it's an interesting point, Senator Arrington, because, um, and again, the, the, the difference and the distinction can be seen just in that subtle difference in how I present that quote and how it's presented in the, in the complaint. Because if you're listening to it and you're listening to the comment that as it's being made, uh, the question you ask actually begs the question that would be asked of somebody listening, which is, we might not have 10 state hospitals for the idiots and the insane, whether or not that's a label for those buildings or whether or not it's a label for the people that are in them. And you wouldn't know that, I would argue, by the way that was stated. The subcommittee voted that Hoffman must offer a written apology to Senator Goodwin and requires that she post a link to the committee's findings on Twitter and remove the original tweet. A new law is something that parents and athletes are going to want to pay attention to. To talk about her bill, we have Senator Michelle Benson. Thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. Happy to be here. Senator, let's begin with your bill that is now a law. It directly relates to concussions. What do parents and coaches need to know? Uh, really, the bill just provides a baseline for youth athletes, coaches, and parents to understand some of the dangers of concussion and in particular repetitive concussions uh, when there's already been a concussive incident that you can do a lot of damage if you don't step back from athletic play, allow the brain to rest and recover before you would have another impact or even you know, a minor impact even if it wasn't a concussive incident. And so the idea is to educate further coaches, anybody who's in charge and the athletes as well. How do you plan to implement this education? Well. It's uh, guidelines to be implemented in our high schools, middle schools, and communities. Um, there's a CDC website, it's 30 minutes of training. We're asking that they go on every three years uh, to just review some of the signs, symptoms, and the effects of concussions so that the youth athletes in particular, we want them to start taking more responsibility as they would for any other injuries. Coaches to um, have the tools that they need to ask that athlete to step out of the game, take a break, and uh, get medically evaluated before they return. And parents, obviously parents care greatly about their children, wouldn't want long-term damage, and just raise some awareness with parents. And you're talking about raising awareness. Now, this law does give a lot of leeway to the coaches. It puts a lot on them to pull that athlete out if they think necessary. Are you, are, do you trust that a coach is going to make the right decision here? I think coaches try to do the right thing. Um, this is just to give them the information so they can continue to do the right thing. There are a lot of high schools and club sports that already have higher standards for concussion evaluation than what we're putting in this bill. So again, it's just a baseline. We hope organically people will become more interested and won't need state intervention to, uh, to do this going forward. And there were some interesting statistics that I found when I was doing my research. The Center for Disease Control estimates that 3.8 million sports-related concussions happen each year in the U.S. Sports concussions are the second leading cause of traumatic brain injury among people aged 15 to 24. Given this bill, how much are you trying to reduce that number? Um, we didn't set any specific targets. Um, it will be interesting in a few years to see if we do see a difference. Twelve states have done this. I believe we're the 13th state. And so over time, um, not to reduce necessarily the initial concussion, those things will happen. We're trying to uh, reduce really the traumatic brain injury effect of multiple concussions because concussion upon concussion uh, really has the brain in a vulnerable state and can do some serious long-term damage. The adolescent brain, um, as parents of teenagers know, is a little bit like jello, whereas adults, their brain has started to firm up and uh, the adolescent brain is much more susceptible to injury than an adult brain. So given this law, you did say it's a baseline, it's basically just a guideline. Do you see it maybe growing over time if you find that there might be some holes or you know, there's, no nece there's not necessarily any accountability or any, any penalties involved here? There's not penalties or necessarily enforcement. Uh, I fundamentally believe people will do the right thing if they're just um, 
given some tools and if something's pointed out to them they will do the right thing i think our high schools are going to start being more active in managing their athletes there are some much better programs i don't think the state necessarily needs to mandate their implementation our high schools and middle schools are going to uh, step up and do a good job. They'll protect their athletes. And do you expect parents to maybe step up as well and educate themselves a I bit more? I think the more parents learn, particularly with um, major athletes in the um, Major League Baseball, the NFL, NHL, um, kids look up to those athletes. And so as parents see how their concussions have an impact, parents will become more aware as well. And this is the CDC website is a good tool. Anyone can go on there. They don't need state permission or incentive, they can just go to the CDC website. And, and we'll give that web address right. after this interview. I do want to ask you, Senator, it was your first year with the legislature, so congratulations on that. A new baby, a lot of life changes here. Definitely. Kind of encapsulate your first session for us. I truly love this job. Uh, you get to dig in and do some very serious research on you know, my areas of interest were energy and health and human services. And I will not claim to understand health and human services, but I certainly gained a greater understanding of Minnesota's energy policy and how it impacts business and uh, some of the reforms that are going to be needed in health and human services. So it was the research and the resources available here, hopefully to pass some good legislation. Any pleasant surprises and any major disappointments? Um, the most pleasant surprise was that it wasn't as partisan um, as everybody makes it out to be, and not to blame the media specifically, but fights make news, and when people get along, it doesn't really make news. Uh, Senator Ann Rust hosted a baby shower for me after my daughter was born, and uh, several women from the DFL came, and, and the Republicans, and we came together as moms and women, and it was very, very nice. and I. I have found uh, a lot of wisdom on both sides of the aisle as I seek people who've done this well and uh, people that I can imitate or who can mentor me. And how about any major disappointments? Um, that we could not come to a conclusion in time. And now, obviously, I'm going to be a little partisan. The Republicans did pass their budget, and it was balanced with the revenue that we had available. Um, and I guess I just like to wrap things up in a timely manner, and that was the disappointment for me. Okay, Senator Michelle Benson, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. A well-respected member of the legislature, Senator Linda Scheid, passed away on Wednesday, June 15th, following a six-year battle with ovarian cancer. The DFLer from Brooklyn Park was known as a spirited leader. This past session, she was the author of the Surly Bill, which is regarded as one of the most significant pieces of liquor reform legislation in the state since the early 80s. In a release, Governor Mark Dayton stated, I deeply regret the passing of my good friend, Senator Linda Scheid. Linda and I served together in state government during three different decades. She was smart, hardworking, and independent. Linda always did what she believed was right and what was best for the people she served. She will be missed by all of us. Senate Minority Leader Tom Bach said, While we mourn her passing, it's important that we celebrate and recognize Linda's tremendous career, as well as the differences she made in the lives of so many Minnesotans. Linda was an inspiration to many, both inside and out of the Capitol, and will be remembered for her strength, her passion, her independence, and her commitment to doing what was best for the people of Minnesota. Senator Scheid was 68.